welcome to the Humanities Centre. Uh, thus far, our series this semester has looked at competing theories of truth, the role of truth in different disciplines and fields of inquiry, and questions of the possible tensions between truth and religion, between truth and art. Today, we take a more broadly critical look at the concept of truth itself, and to guide us through this, we have three very distinguished members of our college faculty, eminently qualified to make <laughs> these, <laughs> these issues clear for us. Uh, Julia Kanzler uh, received her PhD from The Ohio State University and her JD from the University of Colorado. She's Associate Professor of Sociology and specializes in the areas of international human rights, law, social movements, environmental justice, and the rights of indigenous peoples. Dr. Kanzler is the author of the forthcoming book, Environmental Justice as Decolonization, Political Struggle and Claims Making over Indigenous Fishing Rights in Australia, New Zealand, and the United States. She'll be speaking to us today about the light thrown upon the idea of truth by the vitally important new project of decolonization. Addressing today the topic of Friedrich Nietzsche's critique of truth will be Michelle Greer. Educated at UC San Diego, where she received her PhD, Dr. Greer is a professor of philosophy here at USD and is one of the world's leading authorities on the philosophy of Immanuel Kant. She is the author of Kant's Doctrine of Transcendental Illusion and is currently at work on two new book projects, one on Nietzsche and the other, I'm told, on a neurophilosophical farce. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've read bits of that. Uh, the third member of our panel is Laurie Watson, a professor and chair of philosophy here at USD. Uh, Dr. Watson received her PhD from the University of Illinois, Chicago, uh, one of the nation's leading feminist philosophers. Her first two books have recently been published by Oxford University Press. These are Equal Citizenship and Public Reason, a Feminist Political Liberalism, and Debating Pornography. Professor Watson will be talking today about standpoint theory. It's lovely to have you all with us here in the Humanities Centre. Please give our guests a very warm welcome. I waved. There we go. Hi, I'm Julia Kanzler. Um, as Dr. Clack said, I'm Associate Professor of Sociology here, just upstairs. Um, and I, like you said, examine issues of environmental justice and decolonization. Um, but I want to start, there we go. I want to start by acknowledging that the land that we gather on today is the traditional and unceded territory of the Kumeyaay Nation. And I ask that we pay respect to the citizens of the Kumeyaay Nation and to all indigenous peoples, both past and present, and their continuing relationship to their ancestral lands. And I provided a little map. You probably have a hard time seeing it in the back. Of the unceded territory of the Kumeyaay Nation here. Um, so you can get a picture for how vast it is um, and the fact that it is divided by um, the US-Mexico border. So just to get a sense of the fact that indigenous territories um, often no no geopolitical boundaries and the state boundaries that they contend with today are kind of arbitrary constructs of political relationships that they themselves weren't necessarily a party to um, but that they have to continue to confront and that it absolutely is relevant to understanding the way indigenous people are able to form their ongoing social relations with each other um, as well as their relationship to their lands, their waters, and the species that have been traditionally relevant to their way of life. Um, and acknowledging the land upon which we are uh, gathering is very important part of the process of uh, decolonization that we'll continue to talk about. Okay, so a little bit about me before I jump in. Um, as Dr. Clack said, I was an attorney. I got my JD from the University of Colorado. I practiced law for several years in the areas of Native American law and environmental law in particular. Um, most of my practice was in representing Indian tribes throughout the Western United States in um, protecting their natural and cultural resource rights. I'm uh, really about protecting tribal sovereignty and the ability of Indian tribes to assert their self-determination over their lands, their territories, their peoples, but also their resources. 
Um, several years into that process, I realized that I was better suited for an academic career than one in the courtroom for reasons that I'm happy to talk to you about in my office hours if you're ever interested. But um, ultimately, my focus continued on indigenous people and the environment. Um, and my current work broadly examines the contemporary instances of political conflict between states and indigenous peoples over traditionally significant natural resources. Um, specifically, I'm focusing on fisheries. So in the process of practicing law and representing Native American people on the issues that mattered to them most and engaging in my own research on colonization and ultimately decolonization, uh, several important things emerged and I just wanna share those first to provide a foundation um, for this talk. First of all, one thing I learned is how important history is um, and how important it is to engage with the past in order to understand the experiences, opportunities, and obstacles that are continually faced by indigenous peoples in settler nations like our own. But, the need to, but we need to go further than this. We can't simply understand colonization in static historical terms as something simply relegated to the past. Rather, colonization is an ongoing process involving the appropriation of native lands and resources and the continuing marginalization of indigenous people from the benefits of contemporary society. It also involves the marginalization of indigenous people from political power and their ability to assert self-determination over their lands and their people. Um, Contemporary scholars tend to talk about this ongoing process as settler colonialism, recognizing in settler societies like our own, where part of the process was really about usurping indigenous lands and replacing indigenous people with settler populations, um, that this is not something that simply ended a century ago. It's an ongoing process. And that settler colonialism really operates, continues to operate on all levels of society. And it's accomplished through, among other things, the force of law, through our education system, and through our dominant mainstream cultural values and narratives that reinforce settler colonial objective. And one of the things that I've noticed and is kind of a centerpiece to the way that I talk about colonization and decolonization from a theoretical perspective is this idea that colonization and settler colonialism operate through two interrelated processes in our society, through social structures on the one hand and through mm. culture. When I'm talking about structures, I'm talking about the physical ways um, and the ways that the law is imposed on indigenous people in order to separate them from coveted lands and resources. Um, so early on, this happened through military force and later on through laws and policies like the one-sided treaties that were often neglected um, and that served colonial agendas, which included consolidating native people onto resource poor reservations, uh, prohibiting traditional languages, religions, and forms of government. And later still, this was uh, accomplished through laws that continue to be passed that are aimed at curtailing indigenous people's access to important natural resources. But I would spend a little bit more time talking about the cultural ways that colonization occurs. Um, and this happens through the creation of mainstream narratives that diminish native cultures by either mischaracterizing the place of native people in the history of nation building or erasing them from these stories altogether. These cultural facets of colonization are particularly relevant for interrogating and ultimately critiquing prevailing notions of the truth, or what we think of as true. Processes of colonization are ultimately battles over the power to define what is true. And not surprisingly, the narratives of the conquerors tend to delineate what is true for everyone by becoming embedded in the fundamental myths of nationhood and the values of citizenship that derive from these so-called truths. And make no mistake, the preeminence of settler truths is not an accidental byproduct of colonization. Rather, it's an intentional strategy of it. It's been accomplished in many ways, including through the historical prohibition of native cultural practices, and through Native people's forced assimilation to settler narratives through Indian boarding schools where indigenous truths were systematically replaced with those of settlers. And this process continues today through the devaluing of indigenous traditional knowledge in such things as natural resource management, which I tend to look at, um, and climate change mitigation, just to give two examples. Because truth is flexible 
and malleable and ultimately socially constructed, it can be weaponized as it has been in the hands of settlers as a tool of colonization. I also argue though that it can be wielded as a tool of decolonization by native peoples as well. So I focus on my research on environmental justice and a lot of people have kind of a fuzzy understanding of what environmental justice is. Environmental justice research fundamentally involves looking at the ways that marginalized communities, especially communities of color, um, experience disproportionate burdens uh, with regard to environmental problems. So we tend to think of this in terms of, for example, the siting of hazardous waste um, industries or hazardous industries in, in urban areas and how these are you know, predominantly located in communities of color. It can also involve understanding how distribution of environmental benefits is also disproportionately allocated in society. Um, and this becomes clearer when we think about indigenous people. My work focusing on fishing rights gives an example of this too, because over time through processes of colonization, um, indigenous people no longer share equally in the distribution of the traditional resources that they used to. And as a result of this imbalance in the distribution of resources, um, the benefits, the economic benefits, the social, the cultural benefits benefits more often are shared by members of the settler community rather than by indigenous people. Scholars of environmental inequality contend that there are three fundamental ingredients of environmental justice. And I believe that these three things are also necessary ingredients of decolonization. And as a result, they provide a very useful framework for interrogating this relationship between decolonization and truth. Um, and before I get into this model, I just have a caveat. Um, I want to say that this model of decolonization is just one of many possible models, and it's really only a partial one at that. There are many other models with varying emphases on the relative compatibility of settler and indigenous worldviews and social structures, and many of them involve different outcomes and processes. My model takes the current political relationships between indigenous people and state governments as a starting point, but it does not mandate an end point. Rather, it sees decolonization as an ongoing process. It's possible to think of this model and probably more appropriate to think of this uh, as a necessary first step for establishing a baseline for more integrated shared governance and coexistence between native people and settler governments. The first ingredient of justice and decolonization is distributive justice. And this involves the equitable distribution of social benefits and burdens in society. Um, and I just talked about this in terms of fisheries and indigenous people. And so you can think about that as, a, as an example of distribu distributive justice. So in that particular case, uh, what it would require to achieve justice is a more equitable distribution of access to the fisheries and to control over these, of these traditional resources. So how is this related to truth? Distributive justice requires acknowledging truths about indigenous rights. These rights derive from pre-existing utilization by native people of these fundamental resources prior to colonization. And but for illegal breaches of treaties or native title rights during the process of colonization, native people would still enjoy unfettered access to their traditionally significant lands, waters, and resources. And they would enjoy, enjoy all the benefits that go along from that, the social, cultural, economic, and political benefits. Distributive justice also requires dismantling settler narratives which are simply versions of the truth that justify the usurpation of native resources based on often vacuous rationales like the idea that these resources are legitimate spoils of war or that native resource practices are antiquated or backward and that environmental resource protection requires that these resources be in the hands of settler institutions where they employ Western scientific methods. Of course, ignoring the fact that indigenous people and their traditional knowledge has developed over millennia in relationship with these resources and that they might be particularly well suited to know something of natural resource protection. Environmental justice and decolonization also require procedural justice. Um, this requires the procedural redistribution of power in decision making about issues that directly impact native communities. It's more than simply requiring consultation with native peoples like we saw with the Dakota Access Pipeline situation. And it requires more than a seat at the table. Full justice rather requires centering indigenous voices in policymaking. This is ultimately all about establishing the necessary social and political power to define what is true. 
And not surprisingly, it's the narratives created by those in positions of authority that take on the mantle of truth and become formalized through laws and policies into the structures that continue to shape Native people's lives. So by becoming authorities with decision-making power, Indigenous people can infuse Indigenous truths into social structures where they become formalized and ultimately normalized. Finally, um, decolonization requires justice as recognition. This involves the recognition of Native people's unique experiences with colonization and how this makes them particularly vulnerable to social marginalization and continuing oppression. It also requires the validation and recentering of Native people's cultural values, their knowledge, and their expertise. I believe that justice and decolonization also require acknowledging the ugly truths of our settler societies and the privileges that have accrued as a result of colonization. This can be challenging for settler populations, but I believe it's necessary for relationship building, healing, and ultimately for egalitarian coexistence with Native people. Doing so requires turning a mirror on our society's structures, on our institutions, but also turning a mirror on our own histories and our own personal stories. I'm gonna give you an anecdote from my own personal narrative to give you an idea about how this could look in our own lives. Uh, two summers ago, I joined Ancestry.com as a way of trying to track my ancestors, but ultimately trying to find the identity of my maternal grandparents. My grandmother was adopted in Ireland, and we don't have any idea who her parents were, so I decided to engage in this journey as a way of trying to figure out who they are. Um, in the process of doing this, I kind of went down the rabbit hole, um, when was able to track my uh, ancestors eight to ten generations back to Europe to places like Scotland, England, France, Germany, Denmark, uh, and a lot of other places actually, Switzerland. Um, at first, I, it was exciting as I discovered ancestors who were Scottish aristocracy, uh, some who were among the very first European settlers of New Amsterdam and Virginia Territory in the 1600s, and still others who fought for the Americans in the Revolutionary War. But then I discovered other stories, which were more challenging stories to my own personal narrative, including the stories of those who arrived in the 1600s and the 1700s in Pennsylvania, Virginia, South Carolina, and North Carolina, who settled on and actively displaced Native people from the Delaware, Powhatan, Tuscarora, Catawba, Creek, and Cherokee nations, among others. Sometimes they did so through violent conflict, of which some of my ancestors personally engaged. Later, some of their descendants, also my ancestors, owned slaves, and they fought as members of the Confederate Army to protect their rights to do so. These truths are part of my personal story and they're relevant to understanding how I came to be standing here today. But acknowledging difficult truths like this can't stop with our own histories, or this runs the risk of reinforcing the idea that oppression and col colonialism are simply relics of the past rather than ongoing processes. By acknowledging my personal history, I must force myself to examine all of the privileges that accrued as a result of the fact that my ancestors were not enslaved, yet they perpetuated the system of slavery in this country and that my ancestors were not forced to relocate to Oklahoma Territory on the Trail of Tears, as so many of their neighbors in the Appalachian Mountains of North Carolina were, yet they, and ultimately I, benefited from their relocation. An important part of truth-telling in the context of colonization is the acknowledgement of the power of privilege. Privilege enables settlers and their descendants to turn a blind eye to difficult truths and their ongoing ramifications. Privilege allow people to pick and choose what truths to acknowledge. Oftentimes those are the ones that benefit them and also which ones to ignore, often the ones that threaten their privileged status. Most significantly, the denial of historical truths absolve the living beneficiaries of colonization of any responsibility to engage critically with its legacy or play a part in, in dismantling its structural and cultural legacies. Yet this is something that must be done if we are to move toward a more just and egalitarian society. I wanted to finish today um, by providing a couple potential roles that we could play as members of this campus community to further the process of, of decolonization. Um, ultimately, we ask what truths about our institution must we acknowledge and speak to in order to further this process. And this is not an exhaustive list. 
I argue that we must recognize the role of education in perpetuating settler colonialism, as this occurred through Indian boarding schools, and the way that indigenous people are omitted from academic narratives, or where they are included, they're most often included as passive subjects in someone else's story. We should acknowledge and speak to how naming processes, such as the naming of Sarah Hall, in which we all sit, privileges the identity of colonial oppressors, elevating them to the status of heroes while erasing indigenous people and the violence they experience through colonization from the narrative. We must acknowledge how settler colonialism continues to present obstacles to the enrollment and matriculation of native college students. Decolonization requires that we recenter indigenous voices in higher education and ensure that native people play key roles in decision making about curricula and campus spaces. So I'll leave you with that. I'm happy to answer questions after we're all finished today. Thank you very much. The preface to Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil begins as follows. Suppose truth is a woman, he asks, what then? Are there not grounds for suspicion, he continues, that all philosophers, insofar as they were dogmatists, have been very inexpert about women? Nietzsche is well known for his caustically provocative attacks on many of our, or what was then many of his, um, most unquestioned ideals. Ideals as, for instance, are, um, including our faith that existence or becoming has a goal or aim, that our belief, our belief that there is something such as goodness itself, that certainty is preferable to uncertainty, that truth trumps falsity, and so on. In line with the passage cited above, Nietzsche suggests that at least up until now, we have been very inexpert at wooing this woman truth. It is not merely that philosophers, the self-described lovers of wisdom, have demonstrated themselves to be embarrassingly clumsy and feckless in exercising their efforts. The problem is deeper than that. In Beyond Good and Evil, Nietzsche indicates that the problem with our attachment to the truth is that it lacks the kind of grounding it assumes. What in us really wants truth, he asks. Suppose we want truth. Why not rather untruth, uncertainty, even ignorance? Here Nietzsche is introducing what we may call a meta question concerning the value of the value truth. Indeed, Nietzsche often engages in these second order inquiries into the value of what he refers to as the hitherto reigning ideals. One of which, of course, is truth. In this, he is well known for his genealogical investigations, which typically lead to surprising results. When Nietzsche attempts to find the origin and value of moral value, for example, values, um, for example, his investigations lead us to decidedly immoral, or at the very least, amoral groundings. In the case of the question of the value of truth, we are led to decidedly illusory and erroneous bases. Without going into details, he often suggests that the concept of truth, like all concepts, is an abstraction generated from socio-political intersubjective norms and thus has its basis not in some absolute reality, but in human language. On many, many occasions, Nietzsche goes farther, suggesting that even these linguistic norms are themselves ultimately reflections of, or metaphors for, uh, bodily phenomena. He, the, he's all over the map on that one. He took nerve stimuli, drives unconscious instincts. Thus he's um, told, said to um, provide a semiotics of the body. What then is truth? His claim, a movable host of metaphors, metonymies, anthropomorphisms, in short, a sum of human relations which have been poetically and rhetorically intensified, transferred, and embellished, and which after long usage seem to a people to be fixed, canonical, and binding. Truths are illusions which have become worn out and have been drained of sensuous force, coins which have lost their embossing and are now considered as metal and no longer as coins. To gloss briefly, the kind of truth at stake for, say, the philosophers is ultimately grounded in useful, expedient, possibly beneficial norms that are historically generated and which are linguistically secured by words and concepts which are always unique to us. Herein lies Nietzsche's infamous rejection of the concept or ideal of truth. In short, it is a lie. 
It is a lie in the sense that it issues from a multifarious number of moving uh, interests, drives, historical conditions, and norms to which the eventual concept of truth does not properly apply. Because of this, Nietzsche has often been taken to reject the coherence of the idea of truth altogether, to deny that there is any such thing as truth at all, and so to propound a self-defeating and radically relativistic epistemology. This, however, is misleading. For the real aim of Nietzsche's critique is not to show that the use of the concept of the word cannot be applied appropriately in many cases. Rather, he objects to the notion that there is the truth, the truth, as people say, with a capital T. Here, the kind of truth under scrutiny is the eternal and necessary truths um, so beloved by the dogmatic philosophers. The notion of truth, this notion of truth, issues from a standpoint that is not one to which we can legitimately um, uh, claim title. Indeed, a host of other assumptions undergird this so-called truth. One is that there is an absolute and mind-independent reality, and that truth is attained when our beliefs, our words, our concepts, correspond to and map onto the way things really are in themselves. Even this, however, presupposes that there is a true world, as opposed to, say, our world, a stable state of affairs beyond the Heraclitean flux of or ordinary shifting experiences and points of view. It is interesting to note that Nietzsche often links the idea of truth to that of God. Indeed, Nietzsche seems to think that the notions of ultimate reality, being, God, and truth all clasp pans in an uncanny and collusive alliance. For Nietzsche, it is an unholy alliance. The claim is that this cluster of ideas emphasize reason, objectivity, and a goal that could only be attained in some beyond. Both Christian morality and traditional philosophy, that is, share the general view that value and meaning stem from objective, transcendent, and absolute standards of rightness, of truth, which ostensibly demand that we acknowledge their prescriptive force and legitimacy. The upshot, as we shall see, is that this bundle of conceptions serves to devalue this world, the body, and alternative perspectives. In erecting a true world, God, truth itself, and pos positing them as absolute, we introduce something akin to a set of closed systems, systems which allow of no alternative or other standpoint. It may seem strange that Nietzsche so links the ideas of God and truth, particularly because he has become so well known for his, <laughs> his scathing polemic against uh, morality. And if we take him at his word, God is already dead. Perhaps we secular thinkers have already freed our conception of the truth from its problematic connection to God. Perhaps we are not subject to Nietzsche's criticisms. Not so for Nietzsche. For even our more modern secular enlightenment thinkers those who embrace science over God and religion, they too are still wedded to the same presumption that there is some absolute truth lurking out there. Thus, even if one were to dispose of God, Nietzsche argues that science is still plagued by its attachment to a mind-independent true world. You will gather what I am driving at, he says, namely that it is still a metaphysical faith upon which our faith in science rests, that even we seekers after knowledge today, we godless anti-metaphysicians, we too still derive our flame from the fire ignited by a faith millennia old, the Christian faith, which was also Plato's, that God is truth and that truth is divine. Elsewhere, science, he tells us in the genealogy, still rests on the same foundation, on the overestimation of truth, more exactly, on the same belief that truth is inestimable and cannot be criticized. So there are a number of problems here. One is the f that the philosophical conception of truth drags along with it an entire phantasmagoria of other ideas and illusions. The other is that all of these are grounded in a questionable and ultimately, as we shall see, nihilistic metaphysics. There is another, perhaps a deeper, to my mind, concern which has to do with the paradigm being presupposed by these ideals. More specifically, Nietzsche takes issue with the postulation of standards as absolutely objective in the first place, and he does so because this paradigm masks 
the essentially evaluative activity that in a deep sense we are. We have seen that Nietzsche denies that our ideas and beliefs, our ideals, map onto, correspond to, and reflect a self-subsistent, unconditionally true, and therefore metaphysical order of things. Nietzsche suggests, rather, that our ideas and beliefs are to be understood as products of our own activity. Whether individually or collectively, they are products which we project onto the world. As such, our ideals, even the highest ones, are to be construed as interpretations or constructions. What is crucial here is, that Nietzsche, is Nietzsche's contention that all such interpretive activities are evaluative. They are ways of placing value and meaning. These modes of valuing thus reflect our various strategies for organizing and indeed dominating our world. Will to power, I think, is at least in some sense Nietzsche's way of expressing what he takes to be this aggressively evaluative activity on the part of human beings. Given that he takes our ideals to be ways of legislating values and meanings, Nietzsche turns away from the traditional attempts to justify knowledge claims as to whether or not they correspond with the true nature of things. In accordance with his concern over the value of such values and ideals, he attends instead to the function they have for us. What makes these ideals necessary for us? Do they serve to affirm or to deny life? On this score, Nietzsche clearly takes ideals to be linked up with prescriptions for certain styles of life. And indeed, Nietzsche tends to suggest that every conviction, every position, every ideology reflects the degree of health of the individual culture or epoch expressing it. And in accordance with this symptomatology, according to Nietzsche, some ideals are, or ideologies are more life-affirming than others. Thus, we come to another Nietzschean theme, nihilism. The term nihilism is used by Nietzsche in many ways, but for our purposes, a few points will suffice. In the Nachlass, Nietzsche refers to nihilism as a realization. It means that the highest values have devalued themselves. One of these realizations is that there is no true world beyond the domain of existence and becoming. So long as we remain attached to the idea of truth, a true world beyond, with or without God, we are still playing the same metaphysical game. And importantly, to posit such a, a true world uh, in a transcendent beyond is to reduce this world to mere appearance. It is to diminish the value of this world. Moreover, it is to define epistemological success in terms of standards which cannot ever be met by us. And from the point of view of human existence, what is the value of doing this? For Nietzsche, whatever value this theocentric standpoint, um, which is certainly not a human standpoint, may have had once, the value is now dissipating when the claw fingers of the mind reach out to grasp the necessary and eternal truths, alas, there is nothing there. Thus, according to Nietzsche, oh, he loves Heraclitus, Heraclitus will always be right in this, that being is an empty fiction. The apparent world is the only one. The real world has been lyingly added. If there is no transcendently real world, then what of truth? Are we not back to jettisoning the idea of truth altogether? At least part of Nietzsche's answer relates to what has come to be known as his perspectivism. This position is well captured in a number of passages in the genealogy. The central point is that the concept of, of wait, sorry, the concept of truth demands, as he says, quote, that we should think an eye that is completely impossible an eye turned in no particular direction in which the active and interpreting forces through which alone seeing is seeing something are supposedly lacking. According to Nietzsche, such a standpoint is an absurdity for, quote, there is only a perspective seeing, only a perspective knowing, and the more affects we allow to speak about one thing, the more eyes, different eyes, we can use to observe the one thing, the more complete will our concept of this thing and our objectivity be. 
the absolutistic, dogmatic, and theocentric position adopted by the so-called men of knowledge, Nietzsche says, involves standing truth on her head and, and denying perspective. It is thus that Nietzsche advocates an experimental philosophy, one which is open to, nay demands, that we approach our investigation less dogmatically, looking at a problem or topic, whether it be morality and religion, philosophical and scientific thinking, or whatever, is best advanced by a willingness to revise and develop, to discard and to proceed, and to do so by adopting different perspectives, different points of view from which these topics may be revealed to us. In this sense, the project of knowledge acquisition cannot proceed from a theocentric standpoint that presumes to have access to the final and incontrovertible truth. In already positing the end point of our philosophizing, such an approach shoots down further inquiry. The acquisition of truth, then, is an ongoing project, and our knowledge increases as we multiply the ways in which we are willing to, Nietzsche likes to say, dare to, examine the objects of our inquiry. This explains Nietzsche's demand for more levity, more gaiety, more joy in the pursuit of our philosophical and scientific interests, the gay science, Frühlich's Wissenschaft. Insofar as we can no longer uh, invest ourselves seriously and tenaciously in one view claiming absolute authority, Nietzsche suggests as an alternative that we approach our speculative investigations with a certain, um, certain amount of playfulness. At the very least, he thinks this is far superior to falling into nihilistic despair over the fact that there seem to be no stable truths in our world. And it's better than, for him, positing a lie uh, beyond so that we can secure stable truths that we can't find here. This playfulness, however, is serious because with the downfall of absolute and externally imposed standards come an in, comes an increased responsibility for us to cultivate values and meanings ourselves. We need not jettison truth in this latter sense, although we may have to give up absolute knowledge or knowledge of the absolute or Cartesian indubitability and certainty or even the Kantian thing in itself. What is truth? I don't know. Suppose truth is a child. What then? Thank you. Well, I want to thank Dr. Clark for inviting me uh, to do this, and I want to express absolute frustration with him for setting it up such that I follow Dr. Greer. Uh, <coughs> that <laughs> you are a hard act to follow, in other words. That was awesome. Um, so my topic today uh, is standpoint epistemology. Um, I'll talk a little bit in a moment about how knowledge relates to truth, um, primarily from a feminist perspective. So standpoint epistemology is broader than feminism per se, um, but I know more about feminism than other things, so uh, it worked out that that was my uh, topic of choice in, uh, in terms of subfield. Um, I'll also add that this is meant to be a kind of, you know, feminist standpoint epistemology 101. Uh, so. I hope that that proves beneficial. Um, so the, I'm going to use the term knowledge, and that isn't the same as the word truth, you may note, um, but they're related uh, in the sense that philosophers, um, in their pursuit of knowledge, want to have true beliefs, right? Well, all human beings, I suppose, uh, except for Nietzsche, Nietzsche. <laughs> uh, <laughs> want to have true beliefs. So whatever knowledge is, it involves having true beliefs. Now, how exactly one explains the relationship between knowledge and possessive, possession of true beliefs uh, is a matter of, of some debate. Um, but insofar as standpoint epistemology, which if you're uh, new to philosophy, that term may not uh, grab you, epistemology is theories of or study of knowledge. Uh, and so the contribution that standpoint epistemology makes to thinking about truth is to think, is to offer an account of how knowledge itself is socially situated. Uh, and that runs in co contradistinction to many of the main dominant traditional theories of epistemology, which is that knowledge is something that's accessible equally by all rational persons who possess some common feature, whether it's human reason 
or principles of human nature and experience, but that e everyone is equally situated in the traditional view to have the same access to whatever the set of truths are, whatever knowledge is, everyone can equally access that. The standpoint epistemologist uh, is going to upend that claim and say, in fact, knowledge is socially situated, from which it follows that the social location of human beings, and importantly, uh, the social position human beings occupy is relevant to knowledge and uh, can yield insight and truths that are only accessible from particular social locations, or if you want to say points of view, um, although that's a little uh, inaccurate in that it doesn't reduce to just a point of view. People are, uh, as you know, uh, scholars tend to say, socially constructed by their material reality, meaning they are informed by their environments such that where they're located socially produces uh, a perspective that isn't reducible to just, say, an individual point of view. It will be shared, but only by other people with similar social locations, if that makes sense. So that's the first came, claim, knowledge is socially situated. The second claim is that marginalized groups, because of their social position, have knowledge and access to truths that dominant group members lack. And depending on whom you read, they may utterly lack the ability to gain that knowledge, or they may, uh, depending again on who defines the view, be able to access that knowledge, but only after going through um, some heavy epistemological labor of trying to understand and reveal their own privileges and likely uh, listening um, and uh, granting authority uh, to members of historically marginalized groups to speak about their own experience. So this idea that marginalized groups, because of their social position, have knowledge that dominant group members lack includes uh, two kinds of claims about knowledge. One, we're all probably going to agree to pretty readily. The second one is a little bit more controversial. So the first is just the idea of what it is to be like uh, a member of a socially subordinated group is something that members of socially subordinated groups have privileged access to, right? Uh, so that's the idea that what it's like to live in poverty uh, is something persons who live in poverty have more knowledge or access to or direct experience of that yields truths that people who don't live in poverty don't know or have access to readily, or what it's like to be a woman or what it's like to be a person of color, or what it's like to be an undocumented worker, or to have, as people often say, a disability. That language can be challenged, and we can say differently abled, if we want to have it a more inclusive term. But what it's like to have a differently abled body in a world structured uh, around typical uh, or normatively defined bodies. Um, so, those kinds of what it's like questions are, are uh, or what it's like, the phenomena of what it's like to be a member of that group is something that uh, persons of marginalized groups have um, unique and privileged access to knowledge of and subsequently the truths thereof. But additionally, not just those individual groups, there may be, well, they're not maybe, there are persons who occupy intersecting and, and layered levels of various groups. And they, too, generate unique insights and unique perspectives about things like layered forms of inequality, uh, about how power works, about how race and gender and ability status intersect in ways so that um, the experience of all women, if we want to try to talk about that, uh, can't effectively be done without marginalizing or eliminating the perspective of women who occupy in a, unequal uh, social positions relative to more privileged women. So that's, the, that's just a descriptive claim so far that basically the idea that you don't know what it's like to be a member of a socially subordinated group of, not, of which you are not a member is a descriptive claim. There's truths to be yielded from just understanding the descriptive perspective, what it's like to be people like that. The second claim is a little more controversial, and it's that persons I've just described have 
important and privileged knowledge about concepts like injustice, inequality, power, and privilege, just to name a few. So concepts that we come to know the truth of, the scope of, and the meaning of, I mean, philosophers might write entire books on, say, inequality, power, privilege, right? And they might do that if they're you know, trained as an analytical philosopher. Uh, I do this joke with my students where I'm going to show them um, me doing work. I will now demonstrate for you the hard day I often spend doing philosophy. <laughs> it's exhausting. Um, so that idea <laughs> that one can simply reflect, there are no arms on that chair, but from an armchair as it were, and discover conceptual truths about important uh, concepts like injustice is something that standpoint epistemologists are going to deny uh, or do deny. Um, and claim, rather, we can only have knowledge of these important concepts by orienting our investigation into them from the perspective of marginalized persons, right? So if you want to know what inequality is, perhaps don't ring Ivana Trump's doorbell to ask her, is that even her name, Ivana, Ivanka? One of them. Right. Uh, and ask her what it, was, what it was like to grow up as a Trump. Um, I'm, well, uh, yeah, I just, I went down the rabbit hole there, didn't I? Uh, in any case, her material wealth is not likely to provide us a deep insight about uh, injustice and, and material um, income inequality. So to contrast that with the standard view, as I just you know, did my little performance there, concepts like justice, injustice, inequality have been thought, and many still do think, can be theorized and known from an abstract and impartial point of view that human reasoner um, can step back, reflect, and think, OK, let's do a Venn diagram of what justice and injustice is. Uh, and sort out the conceptual relationships between them, we don't have to consult people who've experienced them uh, in order to know them. The third claim, maybe even more controversial than the one I just made, uh, is, that, is a normative claim uh, suggesting that we ought to begin from the perspective of marginalized groups pers and persons in order to have knowledge of important concepts like injustice or inequality or privilege or how power works, for example, and that we couldn't gain that knowledge otherwise. That is, we, there are truths we would not know if we did not do that. Um, so on the one hand, there is that in here too as well, a descriptive claim. If we want to know what's true, we have to investigate the perspective of historically subordinated and marginalized persons. And there's a normative component. We should adopt that perspective uh, or perspe perspectives, if you will, or intersecting perspectives. Uh, otherwise, we're just simply not going to know important things about justice and injustice. In contrast with the sort of standard view, the idea would be that truth and knowledge are a perspectival, meaning they are not dependent on your social location, they are not dependent on your perspective. So in this uh, theory, I guess I will call it. Um, there is a challenge to traditional epistemology and the claim that a general, universal, and abstract um, account of knowledge uh, and so truth is possible or even desirable. And there's a deep uh, critique of objectivity as it's been traditionally understood. The idea that um, objectivity entails uh, perspective independence. So I want to say a little bit about the historical roots of uh, feminist standpoint epistemology or standpoint epistemology. And then I'll ask a question about a potential objection and try to answer it. Uh, and then I think I'll be out of time. So its historical roots, um, many look to its roots in Hegel. I am not going to give anything like a summary, a lecture, or any kind of tidy description of Hegel. If you want that, you should talk to Professor Greer. So I'm going to say something kind of embarrassingly simplistic. Um, and that is that Hegel, uh, one theme that is central to his work is an analysis of what he calls the master-slave uh, relationship. 
Um, so you might think of that more broadly as the relationship between dominators and subordinators, uh, people in dominant position and subordinate positions. And he argues uh, that if we, analyze, if we want to understand that relationship and how it structures our lives and our uh, psychology, we are more likely to, or we will gain knowledge, only if we look at from the perspective of the oppressed persons. So that thought in Hegel gets picked up in a different way by Marx, right? And if you've read Marx, you have the sense that if you want to understand capitalism, you need to look to the proletariat. If you want to understand economic relations, you need to understand, and you want to understand exploitation, don't look to the capitalists, don't look to the, the people with economic power who define uh, the structure of um, economic exploitation, look to the most subordinated members of the society. So that thought, and those are just two pockets, there's a whole Lacan story that I couldn't even begin to tell you, so that's a thing uh, that I don't know anything about. Um, uh, that thought gets picked up and later developed out of sometimes uh, Marxist feminists uh, into full-blown standpoint epistemology later in the 20th century. Um, now, one thing I, w I just want to put a little bit of concreteness to the ide these ideas to think about what is the real, you know, what is one kind of concrete benefit um, so in, in doing that, uh, of taking this kind of perspective on truth and knowledge. So I want to think about feminist consciousness raising groups as they emerged in the early 70s. Um, and one of the things, I mean, those were essentially women's groups uh, that, in which women sat around and talked about uh, the experience of being a woman in a male-dominated sexist uh, world and what that experience was like um, became an important form of insight uh, about the gendered structure of power and how it's exercised. So just to give an example, one key theme, though not all, uh, or not exclusively, of such consciousness raising groups was sexual violence. And in particular, one of the things that came to be revealed in those groups was the pervasiveness of sexual violence against women. And that yielded a knowledge that was only available if women's voices were taken seriously. So if you want to put it in a contemporary perspective, think about Me Too. So think about Me Too's ability to transform the idea, the Me Too movement, that sexual violence is much more widespread than even people who acknowledged it was widespread uh, had come to know. Uh, so that's one bit of knowledge gained from consulting uh, a group that uh, experiences a certain kind of power uh, in the form of sexual violence. It also yielded the insight that sexual violence and the structure of it has something to do with gender and the way we understand men and the way we understand women, and it had an important transformative effect on some women, and that is it helped to alleviate shame associated with having been assaulted, in which individual women, not in a community of other women articulating their experience, held or were more likely to hold beliefs that internalized uh, the blame associated with uh, the event that, uh, or, or their attack. And sitting in a room with 50 other women who say, yeah, that happened to me too, me too, me too, me too, you think, oh, in a sense, it wasn't about me. It wasn't about something I did. I don't hold that shame. The shame belongs to someone else or to a system uh, in which this kind of behavior is pervasive and unpunished. Um, so other examples would be uh, the way in which the legal concept of consent has been critiqued as reflecting a kind of male perspective and how rape law reform, for example, should occur in light of taking into account the experience of women's perspective and, for example, thinking about what consent means and thinking about, for example, whether a rape can occur in a marriage, right? The perspective of women sexually assaulted in their marriages was part of the social movement to transform a law that not until 1993 in all 50 states, 1993 in all 50 states in the, the U.S., was marital rape recognized as a conceptual legal category? 
Um, so those are some of the practical upshots of how um, thinking about the knowledge uh, members of oppressed groups can share uh, and gain and yield truths for us all can have socially transformative consequences. And Dr. Kantler's talk also uh, emphasized that aspect of social transformation. So the final thing I'll say is that one uh, pressing critique ab uh, about this approach to knowledge and uh, relatedly to truth is that it abandons objectivity. And so now we're all just a bunch of perspectives, a perspectivist, not quite in a Nietzschean sense. And it reduces to a kind of relativism. And that is more or less troubling, perhaps depending on your academic discipline. Philosophers tend to get really upset about the idea that there is no truth, because if there's not, our job is maybe less valuable than we happen to uh, generally think it is. Um, but joking aside, if there is no objectivity, um, that seems like a tr some kind of objectivity, some kind of uh, impartial truth. It seems a, a kind of reduction to absurdity, the view uh, that is trying to uphold voices as revealing something important if that view can't at the same time assert the significance in that view relative to others, the superiority, the more true, if you will, if I can say the more true, uh, the, the, the truth that's revealed. So I think it's unfair to straddle a feminist standpoint epistemologists with the view that they're relativists. Um, uh, and I think that the sense in which they wish to broaden our concept of truth is to highlight that true objectivity, in, not in the distance a perspective uh, from a you know, no, point of view of nowhere, but in the sense of a full accounting of what is possible, what we can know, requires the inclusion of all perspectives, and importantly, perspectives of the oppressed and the marginalized. Thanks. Uh, what role would you say religion has played in all your subjects, colonization, and uh, you know, the psychology of uh, uh, you know, the different aspects that you spoke about today? Okay, sir. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that as far as thinking about the foundations of dominant narratives that um, motivate colonial projects, religion is often central in that even if some of the motivations are more material and economic, the rationalizations are often embedded in religious justification and morality. Um, and so I think that as a sociologist and, and studying the process of decolonization, um, in one way, you know, um, take sort of a critical perspective of that absolutely. Um, on the other hand, examining the positions of indigenous people, there's something um, important about recognizing the validity of ideas about the sacred. And that's part of these alternative narratives that provide this counter hegemonic truth making of indigenous people. So, um, it, it, you can see it on both sides, and I think that um, when we're talking about the processes of colonization and the justification, it's easy to kind of critique that religious foundation. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it there. Um, I guess I would just say um, religion is sort of like one of Nietzsche's favorite whipping boys. Um, it's, um, he sees in the beginning, um, he recognizes that it played an essential role, and he's mostly concerned with the um, Judeo-Christian um, moral tradition. Um, but um, for Nietzsche, it, it, can play, um, it can play a role. It did originally probably, maybe, have some um, positive um, benefits, um, and yet it has come um, to be oppressive. It became um, essentially the dogmatic reliance through faith um, which precludes the possibility of questioning outside the, the system um, became a problem for Nietzsche, right? So. Yeah, I don't know that I have a lot to add, um, or I could add way too much, so I don't know <laughs> which side to err on. But um, I think it doesn't play a specific role in this theory, although uh, 
many of uh, the feminist theorists who, uh, and other uh, critical race theorists, uh, and other groups that embrace a standpoint epistemology would surely critique uh, the way in which truth has been presented within uh, dominant religions um, insofar as it reflects a narrow perspective. And so uh, would probably challenge claims that um, revelation uh, is not culturally mediated uh, by power relations in a way that's problematic and exclusionary. Are you, yeah, are you? No, I don't want to. Both of the positions, um, no, you know, criticism intended, but just be <laughs> playful. Um, yeah, so I, one of the things that I wanted to kind of talk about or hear you guys talk about was just that matter, and to what extent um, could you say more to us about the influence that Nietzsche has had on uh, both of these um, perspectives and decolonization and on feminist standpoint theory? Um, that's kind of one part, just open for you all to reflect. And then the other one is more serious, and that's just to get a, um, a kind of a grip on the notion of objectivity. Um, that both Lori and Michelle were talking about, I think in trying to defend, say, like Nietzsche against the nihilistic kind of dismissal of truth as a whole, uh, and then Lori kind of trying to defend standpoint epistemology against uh, the critique of relativism. So I'm wondering where objectivity fits within like kind of colloquial uses of the notion of truth. Well, thanks for the easy question, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> That's what yeah. I guess maybe I'll start. Uh, so, well, the influence of Nietzsche on critical theory in a broad description is obviously profound, and it depends on which direction you sort of go in, whether there's a flirtation with Nietzsche, if you will, uh, in uh, embracing uh, his approach to critiquing sacred concepts, if you will, like the concept of truth. And then, obviously, as you well know better than I, there are those that sort of take up the burning torch of Nietzsche and go full postmodernism in ways that raise questions about truth altogether. Um, and, and the same is true for standpoint epistemology. There is a range of views. I tried to present the sort of you know, Goldilocks, middle of the road version. I'm not sympathetic to uh, relativistic, relativistic views. Uh, and I think in the case of any kind of standpoint epistemology, the real danger on one side is the factionalism so that every single person's point of view as an individual, of course, that isn't the historical root. There is an idea of group consciousness, though that can become hard to articulate. Uh, but you don't want a reduction to an individualism that makes truth an absurdity. Um, I mean, one, because that's theoretically unpleasant, but also it just doesn't capture anything like the human condition or how we live in the world or how we go. I mean, we have language, we communicate with each other. You'll know when I'm insulting you, you'll know when I'm praising you, all those kinds of things. Somehow that magic happens, right? Um, and so, did I answer your question? You answer, yeah. Okay, all right, that's, and so period. <laughs> This is a lot more challenging for me as a sociologist to answer this question, but it was very interesting sitting here and, and listening um, and being on a panel with philosophers because um, I really got to reflect on how much sociology just takes certain things as given that philosophers spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, for the example, relativity. You know, I mean, I think in a lot of ways, um, the idea of relativism is one that's kind of embedded in most people's sociological points of view. Um, and yet at the same time, we don't really engage with the idea that even though we embrace and accept this idea of relativism, um, many sociologists kind of position, put a lot of faith in notions of justice which, without actually being critical about objective assumptions that are built into that. We don't really engage with that at all. Um, and as far as you know, really engaging with philosophy, you know, if it's not Marx, Weber, or Durkheim, or maybe Hegel, um, you know, we, we don't really engage with it as, as much as we should. But sure enough, have a, you know, like a, as a certain profession or practice 
What's that? Do you have a practice of perspectival representation? Yes, I would, I would absolutely say so without knowing that I did. <laughs> uh, well, I guess I'll just. Oh. Maybe you can answer the question about truth and objectivity, and then I'm going to sit down after apologizing for really asking two questions. Okay. I'll be brief. Um, first of all, there's so many different Nietzsches. The people got their little clutches on Nietzsche, and because of the way that he writes and presents his material, um, um, unsystematically, intentionally so, the way he revises his views, the way he treats his, his positions as literally experiments, um, means that he's gone down in history as being, there's, you got your father of existentialism Nietzsche. There's the existentialist groovy Nietzsche who wants ex you know, free expression and freedom. Well, then you've got your you know, hardcore materialist determinist Nietzsche because he rejects the freedom of the will. Then you've got your postmodern, father of postmodernist Nietzsche. He's not even trying to give a right answer or truth and he's, he's deconstructive. Then you've got your just plain old crazy Nietzsche. You're not, <laughs> we've got the Nazi Nietzsche with the will to power. And I mean, so he's had a range of influences in a lot of different subdisciplines and so on. And I'm probably not the best one to talk about how it, you know, rep from the point of view, from the perspective mm -hmm. of other disciplines. With respect to objectivity, I guess I'd say something kind of like this. Nietzsche, despite his criticisms of Kant, is a Kantian. He's a transcendental idealist. He thinks that subjectivity is constructed by subjectivity. Right. Um, Nietzsche does not think that there are, is objectivity without subjectivity. And he gets, and that goat carries through to Hegel and everything else. Um, so for him, the conception of objectivity is something, it is um, generated um, um, through, uh, by the human mind. Um, and the human action. The diff and so he, he borrows this from Kant. Um, the thing is he wants to get rid of the, you know, the Kantian um, transcendental distinction between appearances and things in themselves. And so the objectivity that is being um, constructed is one that is now grounded in um, social practices, sociopolitical, intersubjective practices and language. And it, it becomes solidified over time and historically. So that's pre-Hegelian mm -hmm. too. So for what it's worth. Uh, this question is uh, primarily just to Dr. Cancel, and but I think it bridges over to the standpoint of epistemology. Yeah, uh, you know, in the mid seventies, uh, when Dennis Bank uh, and the Wounded Knees thing was happening, I had fortune of working at the Lloyd Museum of Anthropology at Berkeley when I was a graduate student. And uh, there was an experience in which uh, a bunch of American Indians came into the museum and they were learning basket weaving from an anthropologist. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, how complete had the deconstruction of culture been that they would be learning from, mm -hmm. from that. And I'm wondering like, even today when you're talking about racial injustice, why is it that the American Indians is falling into a kind of addendum to the bipolar relationship between blacks and whites? Mm. And I'm wondering whether is that, is that because our deconstruction of, of the native people are so complete that it has, it's been sidelined? Or is it because uh, the way the construction of our ideology is, is so bipolar in its own way that it's only the master-slave relationship that in the sense that it probably extends all the way back to Aristotle's exclusion of the middle. Why is it that it's not even a more prominent uh, uh, position that we recognize that rather than just the fact that, oh, it's blacks and whites, and that's kind of the dominant narrative? Mm -hmm. I think that's a great question. I mean, a very simple answer and an incomplete answer is, is a numbers game, right? I mean, uh, Native American people comprise about 1% to 2% of the population versus 15% African American population. Um, and coupled with that is the fact that um, if effectively, indigenous people have been effectively removed and erased in a lot of ways by processes of colonization, by the reservation era, often taking native people and you know removing them to remote areas where they are predominantly unseen. Um, but I think that you can see different um, 
relationships and, and that these issues are become much more prevalent and worthy of concern in areas where there are more Native people. So in the Pacific Northwest, um, I think you hear these conversations happening a lot more because you have more Native people. Um, you know, I do some work in New Zealand, and the Maori people there are about 15% of the population. And so a lot of the race issues that they deal with in New Zealand um, focus on indigenous issues. But I think that there's something compelling about what you're talking about as well, and just in terms of what conflicts are deemed paramount and what aspects of history become the ones that we focus on. And I do think in a lot of ways, like I mentioned before, that the stories of American Indians have really been erased or mischaracterized from our history books. So I think if you combine all of those factors together, it might explain just a little bit of those differences. Topics. Um, so the, the talk about uh, standpoint theory, you, you uh, made the case that considering the perspectives of marginalized people is essential to discovering the truth. Um, the examples that you use were mostly in um, sociological fields, and I was wondering, um, do you think that considering the perspective or the standpoints of marginalized groups could actually change um, the way truth is perceived in disciplines? that are considered, that are traditionally considered more based on the capital T truth, oh, like yeah. science, for like science, yeah. for example, which is, as someone else said, in some ways kind of a secular religion that posits that there's a, a well, truth. Well, there is a whole strand of standpoint epistemology, feminist standpoint epistemology, that specifically originates in a critique of science. I know less about that, but I know, I mean, I could say some things. Um, and. It, it has had power to think about the way, I mean, <clears throat> I'm gonna defend what I take to be the reasonable-ish view, although I don't mean anything by saying, well, I do mean something by reasonable, but, um, <clears throat> and it's that uh, recognition of the way in which research questions get driven by power and money shapes what come to be known as truths or what things are worth investigating, and there's been a whole feminist critique of that kind of, um, incomplete investigation or partial investigation or bias and, a, and an attempt to reorient our thinking about scientific investigation in ways that reveal biases. More radical versions of it would say, or of standpoint theory would say that uh, science is built on a lie and that the kind of truths that you know, object, the kind of objectivity in science is deeply problematic and not achievable. I'm less sympathetic to that kind of strong version because, you know, things working is pretty good evidence that, right, so if you, you know, your vaccine for polio or, or, or uh, smallpox turns out to eradicate that disease in a certain, you know, population or continent or whatever, well, you know, that's pretty compelling uh, <laughs> evidence uh, that, uh, you know, there is a kind of truth or method of investigation that yields truth that corresponds to the world in certain ways that produces good results, right? But, but that view can also be way too simplistic and erase uh, the ways in which research design, funding, things of those nature get structured around, say, white man health problems, right? Uh, so if you think about the way heart disease has been presented as this crisis and the symptoms listed as they are, well, most of those subjects in the, I mean, this critique has forced us to recognize that heart disease is actually the number one killer of women too. It presents itself differently, right? Or that drugs almost always are uh, researched on male bodies because women, no matter their age, although this is false, uh, right, have, uh, well, this is false in many directions. Not all women are potential baby makers. Uh, and some women, even if at one point they were, no longer are, right? But so the male body is taken as a paradigm of truth and objectivity in a way that prevents medical research on uh, women's bodies in ways that harms women and harms children. And so those kinds of things, I think, fall into the kind of standpoint epistemology I would want to defend, although there are those who would push it much more radical. And I realized that that was a long answer to your question. I apologize. Oh, that's very nice. <laughs> there are 
Yeah, I'm trying to, to remember the question. I was listening to her answer. <laughs> the, what you're re, just yes, summarizing. Sorry, on how that standpoint theory can change the content of fields that are typically considered to be like based on capital P terms. Okay. Well, um, I guess from a Nietzschean perspective, he's already advocating that because he's um, disagreeing with the, he's arguing, in fact, that um, the um, scientific conception of truth is still wedded to a kind of transcendent notion of an absolute um, way things really are. And insofar as science is devoted to attempting to disclose the way things really are, you know, Nietzsche thinks that it's going to actually um, limit um, um, scrutiny and investigation. Um, the way in which various points of view, if you're going to speak in terms of like a Nietzschean kind of terminology, various perspectives. For example, let's take um, um, a, a vaccine which is proven to be um, particularly effective until 20 years later when we find out that it has a side effect that, right, this happens all the time. And so what Nietzsche would want to say is that it's important to look at things from very different points of view, even in the sciences, certainly in philosophy, in the arts, in po political theory, precisely because those different perspectives, the, the information gleaned from those different points of view adds to almost an increasing completeness of our concepts and maximizes objectivity. By the way, he doesn't think you're ever going to get there. It, it is an ongoing project. You're never going to be, you're never going to get what Kant says. Kant doesn't think you can get there either, but it's like the place, the final resting place, right? It's never going to happen. So for him, it's an ongoing project, and those different standpoints really do deliver um, information which alters the problem, alters the way we conceive of the problem and the way we address it. So I think he'd be happy for st different standpoints. I mean, all I would say is that this is coming from a, from a sociologist who, you know, our perspectives are, are very, very similar, I think, as the standpoint perspective in terms of the fact that in any endeavor, it's important to hear the marginalized voices. Um, and I think about just the areas of environmental sociology that I teach in. Oftentimes, I have a lot of students from environmental science, and they're not quite understanding the relevance of sociology to what they're doing. Um, and I think it's important just to understand that, that every endeavor, every scientific endeavor, every artistic endeavor has social consequences it's embedded in our society. So it, it, we need to hear those voices in order to understand uh, context and consequences. Thank you.